Welcome again to Side by Side. Today we are thinking about blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Three scriptures that speak, one about peacemaking and two about children of God. James 3 verse 18 says, A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. 1 John 3, 1 describes us as called children of God. And Romans 8, 14 says that all led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. The Bible talks about the peaceful or peaceable fruit of righteousness. The Bible talks about peace with God and the peace of God. And we know that we have peace with God through justification because someone has made peace for us. That's the Lord Jesus Christ in his life, his death. He has made peace for us, vindicated by his resurrection and his ascension. But let me define, or at least attempt to define peace. I think peace is to be found in two different directions. There is peace that is the quality that we experience, an inner peace. And I think that might well be the, the analogy that we have in Psalm 23. We have the Lord being our shepherd who leads us by the streams of water and in the green pastures. There's a, a picture here of a vulnerable animal, extremely vulnerable for sheep cannot defend themselves really at all. But those sheep are able to be at peace because the shepherd has brought them to a place where there is everything they need and there is nothing there that should threaten them. There's a rod and a staff to protect and to, to keep them in line and to keep away those who would harm them. But they can prosper in that place, they can flourish in that place as they experience the quality of peace. But then there's also peace that is a relational word which describes the state of relationship that two people may have. Paul talks about this when he says in 1 Corinthians seven fifteen, strive for peace with everyone. And so here he's not talking about a quality or an experience of something you have, but it's something that exists between you and someone else. And I think that when we are talking about blessed are the peacemakers, we are talking about those who reflect the nature of their heavenly Father, because they are called sons of God, who are trying to bring about a peace between peoples. And I would imagine that once that peace has been established between people, then there is a peace within the individual's hearts. Purity of heart, which we talked about yesterday, is that which leads on to peacefulness and peacemaking. Because out of the pure heart are the pure motives. There's nothing hidden, there's nothing secret, there's nothing insincere. I suppose the handshake, which as I understand it, was meant to be a sign of peace that you were holding nothing up your sleeve, no knife or no hidden, no hidden weapon. So this handshake is an openness to another person. And we know how a handshake is an expression of something peaceful desiring about that person. But God has taken the initiative in the war between us and himself because that's the only way we can describe the relationship that we have apart from grace, mercy and forgiveness. We are at war with God. We set ourselves against him. We choose to disobey his law and we regard him as the king of the universe as a threat to our happiness. So that war exists. But he has come, and I love the phrases that Ray Ortland uses. It's a little message he talked about, in, or in it, it was a Christmas message. He talked about how the Lord has come to declare peace to the earth, not to declare war through his Son. Good news of great joy, peace and goodwill. And it is because the Lord Jesus Christ has made peace through his blood, as Colossians 1.20 says, that we know something of this peace vertically. This is the at one meant or the atonement. We have peace 
the Lord Jesus Christ has borne the wrath for our sin and our guilt, become the sacrifice in our place. And when we trust in him and rest on that promised gift of grace to us in Jesus Christ, we enjoy the fruits of that. And the most important one is that we have a relationship where we're reconciled to God. We can call him our Father and I, no longer our judge, but our Father. And we have this state of peace. And if we are children, sons of God, we will display the characteristics of the Father. Hence, sons of God should be peacemakers. God is a peacemaker supreme. And that was his initiative, and he was willing to take the great price. And for you and I, if we're going to be truly sons of our Father, daughters of our Father, and to work towards making peace, it'll mean a number of things for us. This is not a peace that is forced. Do you know the sort of peace that was brought on Japan? Hiroshima and Nagasaki were the two things that forced the Japanese to make peace. They didn't want to make peace, but it was kind of total capitulation. They were conquered. That's not the way that the Lord deals with us. He doesn't just devastate everything. He reveals our hearts to us. He convicts us of our sin. But we could do like the young man who came to see Jesus with a desire to have eternal life. And because he wouldn't be willing to make the sacrifice as he saw the sacrifice, he was willing to sacrifice the greater thing, which was his eternal future for a small thing, and turned and walked away. And we read that Jesus loved him and let him go. Now, if we are to make peace, yes, like the Lord, there is an initiating. He initiated peace. And there, the, there is also the bearing of the weight of suffering. And that's often the case for us. If you and I want to make peace with others, we have got to bring about a certain willingness to bear some suffering in our own hearts because to forgive another person is to, as it were, assume to yourself pain. You need to be willing to do that. And gospel victory is not standing over people, judging, but it is a bowing down. There's a sort of a servant role in this. Is it not that which is described for us in Philippians that though he was God, he did not think it robbery to be equal with God, but he took upon himself the form of a servant, became obedient unto death, death of a cross. That's all part and partial of this peacemaking. It's becoming the servant. And yet it's not a peace that ignores sin. For Jesus did not ignore sin. He dealt with sin, but it's being gracious with the sinner. Follow on then. When someone is willing to serve in such a manner, what happens? They disarm the enemy. They experience a very different kind of victory, a sweeter victory than and a God-honoring victory. Not, an, not mere appeasement. For the Lord requires repentance. Yet this is still in response to his grace and his love, not just his harsh condemnation. Conviction and guilt fall on us even more when we experience his kindness. Romans 12 says that if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. I remember my own mother who followed a path not of revenge or hate when her husband, my father, abandoned her in a very vulnerable and a very difficult experience. She was always gracious, always open-handed, always keeping the door open for a repentant man if he would come. Now he didn't, but she opened a door in my heart to see the power of real peacemaking. What benefit would it have been to welcome home an unrepentant man? That would have done him no good. He needed urgently to experience the vertical peace as well. The same is true in evangelism or in making peace between differences in church. It has to be built the way God does it, with honesty and truthfulness and humility and repentance. And then the end, it will be such a blessed peace. It will be a deep peace between peoples and groups and individuals. And, and even finally, <laughs> in the new kingdom, not on this earth, but in God's new kingdom, between nations themselves. 
when all gather round and exalt gladly the one Lord and the one Saviour. Amen.